What's good, child? It's your boy Winfrey Optics, and I'm coming to y'all today with a full retouching walkthrough. So, if you if you guys have been waiting on me to drop a video showcasing exactly how I go about um, editing my photos from beginning to end, then this is the video that you've been waiting on. So, I'm going to start off by kind of just breaking down. <clears throat> each and every part of the editing process that I go through when it comes to retouching my images and making sure that they are perfect or close to perfection um, before I, you know, submit them to Instagram for them to not show no love. But we ain't going to get into that part. Um, what we are going to get into, though, is the actual editing process so first things first before anything else i want to i want to tell you guys that the software that i use the plugin that i use the um the panel that i use it's called retouching academy now if you guys have heard of retouching academy then you already know what it's about but for those who don't know what retouching academy is retouching academy is basically a panel of actions that helps your workflow tenfold um it pretty much has a lot of the actions and a lot of the tools that you need to use in order for you to properly edit a uh, retouch a photo uh, from beginning to end they have dodge and burn they have frequency separation multiple different variations of it um, they have luminosity masking, they have stuff for makeup and hair, uh, your highlights, your eyes, your smiles, um, you know, to get that glow, remove facial hair, hair highlights, you know, they have quality control, which is, um, you know, your solar curves, your uh, oversaturation, and then you can also import your own user actions in as well. They also have at the bottom your levels, your curves your hue and saturation your color selection um you know they have your liquify your smart liquify tool your sharpening add a layer duplicate a layer um they and, and you can also save it uh, and resize it either to make it bigger or for way up or anything like that so it's very useful if you're trying to get a lot of edits out uh, in a short amount of time, or if you just want to uh, expedite your workflow in general, Retouching Academy is definitely something that you can invest in, and it's not going to um, be something that you regret. So without further ado, I am actually going to break down exactly how you can create these layers yourself without having to use um, Retouching Academy if you don't own the panel as of yet. Uh, if you've purchased this video, then I'm pretty sure that you don't want to also go and purchase the Retouching Academy. I believe it's like $70 right now, but I could be mistaken. Um, they're not sponsoring this video anyway. I just use it for the majority of my edits. And so this is actually just bringing me out of my comfort zone of actually having to um, do everything step by step um, by hand instead of having Retouching Academy do it for me. So. Without further ado, I'll just go ahead and jump straight into the editing this photo. So for starters, what we want to do is the very first thing that I always suggest people do when it comes to retouching is frequency separation. Now, as you can see, you can do it. Uh, if you're using Retouching Academy, you can use your Gaussian blur or you can use median or you can use custom. Custom, it actually just allows you to select each each different part of um, your settings for frequency separation. But for this video, like I said, I'm going to break it down step by step and by hand so you guys can see exactly how you can get your photos to look similar to mine. So for starters, we're going to press Control J twice. What this does, it duplicates your layer and, it, and creates two different copies. We're gonna name the first layer color and then we're going to put low frequency and when you're doing this you can easily um, let these become your own actions 
uh, if you want me to create a video showcasing how to create your own actions, then I will gladly do so um, per request. But uh, yeah, so far we're just doing this straight by hand. So once we've named our color layer, we're gonna go up here and name our texture layer next. So this is we would be considered as your high frequency layer. So generally once we've done that, I generally just have OCD when it comes to if stuff is either capitalized or spelled correctly. So I'm gonna make sure I make that change. Got it. So generally once we do that, um, you'll hide your texture layer and you'll click on your color layer. Now, what you wanna do from here is you wanna to go to filter, you wanna to go to blur, and you wanna to go to Gaussian blur. Now, frequency separation with Retouching Academy automatically sets your radius at 6.4. Now, 6.4 is a sweet spot just because it does retain majority of the detail in your photo. Um, no matter if it's an in-studio shot, an on-location shot, Airbnb, whatever, generally 6.4 is your sweet spot. Now, if you don't know what the radius is about, then let me explain it to you like this. The same way that you change your aperture to either retain more detail or to have more of a um, have more of a softer look, then you'll want to adjust your aperture to do so, whether you're going to take it up to get more detail or you're going to take it down to get a softer look. The same thing applies to your radius. You're either going to take your radius up if you want to retain more detail or you're going to want to bring it down to not have as much detail in it. And I'll show you guys the difference. So, I'll do one at six point. Uh, I'll do one at two point eight, at six point four, and at like nine, um, just so you guys can see the different variations of how each one is used. But for starters, we're going to start off with the six point four. Actually, we're going to start off with the two point eight, and we can see that as we change the radius, it shows you how many, how much detail is going to be um, retained in the image. So let's just jump back up to 6.4 and you can see that the less details that you see on the Gaussian blur layer means the more texture is going to be applied on your texture layer. So 6.4, you see it's still, you know, pretty much, you can see some of the details in, in it, not too much. And that's generally where you want to, where you want to be at um when you're retouching images and then we'll just go up to nine now nine you can see it pretty much takes away all the texture within the image um you really don't see any of the specs you don't see any of the blemishes you don't see any of the texture at all that's generally um when it's going to retain the most texture for you when you don't see any type of texture in your little preview window right here when you don't see any at all it's, it's pretty much keeping all of the uh, all of the texture in there. So, like I said, we're gonna start off at 2.8, and we're gonna go from there. So now, the next thing that you want to do is you want to unhide your texture layer, and then you want to go to Image. You want to go to Apply Image, and you want to do as follows. You want to make sure that the layer that you're that you're sourcing from is your color free, um, layer. And then you want to make sure that your blending mode is on subtract. Now, mine is automatically set to the scale of two and an offset of 127. And those are the same settings that you wanna make sure that your stuff is on. Um, I don't know why this, um, this works the way that it does, but it does. So just go ahead and go along with it. Um, so you wanna put your scale at two and you wanna put your offset at 127. This will subtract the texture out of your color layer and create your high texture layer. So we're gonna press okay. And then we're gonna go up here to our blending options, or you can just double click on the texture layer itself and it will bring up this, this menu, your layer style menu. And you wanna to go to blend mode and you wanna just set that to linear light. So as you can see, with it and without it, the image really didn't change too much. It darkened it up a little bit. Not sure why I did that. 
uh, to the background, but it's pretty much the same image through and through. We can go in, we still see all the details, we still, you know, see all the blemishes, all the texture and everything like that. And it doesn't look like anything really changed too much. So what we'll do, I generally don't like to work on just the texture layer itself. Um, and this probably is just because Retouching Academy has me spoiled a little bit. But generally what you want to do is you want to duplicate by holding down Alt and just dragging up or you can just press Control J and then hold down Alt again. You'll see this little emblem come up and you'll want to just create a clipping mask. This actually gives you a little bit more um, of a way to sharpen your image up, sharpen that texture up a little bit more just uh, in case you want to go in and you know, do some other things to it. But generally, this is the layer that you're gonna work on, not the first one. So after that, we'll create one more layer and we'll call this the correcting tones layer. This is exactly how um, the frequency separation panel has it for Gaussian blur frequency separation. So we're gonna go with the same steps and create the same way. So once we've um, named and um, fixed all, everything that we've um, what that we need for frequency separation, we're going to click and hold all of them. Well, we're going to select all of them. My bad. We're going to select all of them and we're going to press Control G. What Control G does, it just groups all the layers into one. This is the best way that you can create your presets and your actions just so you can know what all uh, is included in that um, group and also just keep, keeps everything a little bit more organized. Now, what I did forget to mention is that your correcting tone layer is probably gonna be your least used um, layer just because this is the layer that you use your regular brush tool and you actually go in and actually paint in any type of you know tones that you haven't corrected with your low frequency layer um, with the blending. Um, but we'll get into that in a second. So we're gonna just name this frequency separation and we're going to create another one so i'm actually going to time lapse through this part just so you guys don't have to sit and watch me do the same thing every single time but we're going to do one um for 6.4 and we're going to do one for nine as well so i'm going to go through the same steps to create each and every one of those and then i'll get back to you guys after i'm finished All right, so now that we have all of our different uh, frequency separation layers on, we're going to work with the first one, which was 2.8. So 
First things first, we always want to go to our mixer brush tool. If you don't know where your mixer brush tool is, if it's not here uh, under your brush tools, then it's going to be at these little three dots right here. And these little three dots just pretty much have all of your additional tools that you cannot find in their regular place. Generally, this is something that you have to change in Photoshop, but you know, for this, it's already there. So we're gonna go to our mixer brush tool. Now, what I wanna note first is that your settings for this matter. Now, not only do you not want it to pick up every brush stroke that you do, but you want it to clean the brush after every single stroke. So you wanna make sure that this setting is on. Now, your settings are going to be as follows. Now you can change this however you want, however you choose to, but these are my general settings for using my mixer brush tool. So my wet is on 30, my load is on 57, my mix is on 75, and my flow is on 30. Now this one right here, which is smoothing, uh, I generally don't have a smoothing um, percentage on just because it generally creates a lag whenever you're trying to uh, edit. So I generally don't do that. Um, it doesn't really matter what type of processor or anything your computer has. It generally just creates a lag in general. So I generally just keep it off and put it at zero. So the first thing that we're gonna do is at 2.8. Now remember, like I said, when you change your radius, you either are retaining more detail or you're taking away more detail. And I'm about to show you guys how. Now on your low frequency layer, this is only about blending. This is not about anything else but blending. So you're only going to be using your mixer brush tool on this low frequency layer or on your color layer to be exact. So generally what I like to do is I like to go around the face. Now, as you can see, it's pretty much, it, it still has the detail in it. Don't get me twisted, don't get it wrong. It still has the detail in it. And it's more than likely just because I put this, I didn't put this on normal, I just put it on regular. But uh, you wanna make sure that you're always on your color, your low frequency layer when you're, whenever you're blending. Now you see colors are blending together a lot smoother. And as you can see, I'm not just making any um, rash strokes. I'm not making any, you know, quick strokes. I'm actually going with the contour or the shape of what I, what it is that I'm editing. So if I'm editing the skin uh, of the face, then I'll go along with the cheekbones. I'll go along with the nose. I'll go along with the forehead. You know, I'll try to go in the direction of whatever it is that I'm editing. Um, generally, just because it, it makes it a little bit more appealing um, than if you were to, you know, do it just straight lines everywhere. Now, straight lines do work uh, in certain instances, but you want to make sure that you're kind of being more artistic with it, being more a little bit more creative with it, and actually going along with the contour of the face. Now, as you can see, as I'm doing all of this, if we compare the two, it definitely softens up your subject's skin a lot more. Now, this this look may look good to some people. This may be just the amount that you need in order for you to get the photos, you know, to come out the way that you want them, want them to come out. But this this type of editing can kind of be related to airbrushing in a sense. So you don't want to have that airbrush look. I kind of cringe every time somebody says that you're good at airbrushing, even though that's what you're doing, you know, it's still kind of cringy to, you know, have somebody refer to your your style as that. Now you can easily go back, go back in, like I said, and change your radius. But most times, you know, once you've gone through this entire process, you don't really want to redo it again. So that is the difference between your, that's what 2.8 does. Now, like I said, a lot lower. So it's, it's, uh, it takes away a little bit more detail than if we were doing it at 6.4. So now we're going to go to the 6.4 one. So we're going to go to our low frequency. We're not changing anything, but which frequency layer, frequency separation group we're working on. So now we're going to our 6.4 and you'll see that as I'm going through 
and blending these colors together with my mixer brush tool. You'll see it's retaining a little bit more detail than that 2.8 did. Now 2.8 and 6.4 is a relatively big jump. So of course you'll see more of a difference in the blending um, because of how stark the change is versus let's just say when we go to nine, it might not be as um, apparent, but it might be, we'll, we'll see. And sometimes you gotta work work and change, um, you know, your settings as you, you know, as you're going along through the editing process. A lot of the times, you know, we just chew one, pick it and be like, all right, cool, that's, that's it, that's done. And then we don't turn around and, you know, look at the work or, um, reevaluate it or anything like that until you know later on months down the line and we're like damn I should have did you know something different so as you can see we just did the exact same thing but you see a lot more detail is being introduced in this one than in this one both still look good but one just has way more detail than the other so the next one that we're going to do is the nine. Now, this is the radius of nine. So we're pretty much going to assume that it's going to retain majority of the detail in there, in here versus our six. Now you might be thinking, you know, it don't really look too much, you know, too different or anything like that. And that's just because, like I said, it's not as, as big of a, a difference in the radius uh, that we had with the 2.8 and the 6.4. You know, 6.4 and, and nine are only a, a few numbers off. So it's not going to be too drastic of a change, but you can still tell that, you know, the colors are being blended and we can still see detail. We can still see, you know, everything that, you know, we saw in the other two but it's just slightly more detailed. We got a little, we got a few things that are coming, um, that are still being visible even after we, you know, go over them. Um, we have a few areas that, you know, don't get completely blended away when we go through, um, you know, the frequency separation for the other ones. Um, so yeah, like I said, depending on how much detail and how much work you want to put into the actual edit itself, then, you know, your radius does matter. So let's look at all three. So just to show you guys from the jump. So this is the original image. This is at 2.8. This is at 6.4. And this is at 9. I forgot to turn that one off. So this is, and this is at nine. So let's, let's try that again. 2.8, 6.4, nine. Now, as you can see, none of these, none of these actually change the image too much. However, you do see that it's changed as far as the amount of texture that's in each image. So generally the one that I'll probably go with would more than likely be nine. For studio shoots, I like to have my my radius higher just because I like to keep the um, realism into it. I try not to make it too soft of an image. So we'll just delete these other two and we'll just stick with our frequency layer, uh, our frequency separation layer um, of nine that we chose. So after we've done that, then our next thing that we have to do is our texture layer or a high frequency layer. So generally when you do your your texture layer, a lot of people have gotten it twisted in the past and I don't know how this ended up happening, but a lot of people 
confuse what layer they should use their mixer brush tool on. So some people might try to go in and fix, let's just say this, you know, wig cap right here, this little lace front right here. Some people might just try to go in and just blend right over and be like, okay, yeah, that's cool. That's exactly what I'm looking for. No, that's not exactly what you're looking for. You actually took out all the texture. You just blended the texture together. And that's not what we're trying to do. We're, we want to retain the texture, but we, but we want to blend out, you know, the blemishes and the imperfections and things like that. So generally what we want to do is go to our clone stamp tool. Now your clone stamp tool can change as far as hardness, as far as variation of flow and everything like that, just depending on how much you want to you know retain and how much you want to keep and how much of a difference you want to make in the photo. But these are my settings for it. opacity at 100 and our flow is on 40%. Now why you want to use your clone stamp tool on your texture layer is because what it does is is only taking from the texture layer itself. It's not is only taking from this layer. It's not taking from any other layer other than your texture layer. So you wanna make sure that you're retaining the texture on the texture layer itself. So if we wanna go in and remove any blemishes, we can sample by holding down Alt and clicking, and we can go through and take out those same, those details that we don't want in there. This is a good way to get rid of bags, this is a good way to get rid of any lace fronts. This is a good way to, you know, get rid of any type of blemishes that's our, that are, that's in tight spaces. And sometimes when you're using frequency separation, your blending actually can eliminate some of the blemishes that you'll find or that you'll encounter when editing. But for the most part, you know, this is where majority of your editing is going to be. Um, when it comes to taking out um, take unwanted textures uh, in your photo. So you'll generally want to go in and, you know, you wanna make sure that you're constantly sampling around your photo. You don't wanna sample in one area and then think that that's gonna be enough for the, for the rest of the image. You wanna generally keep the consistency um, between the areas that you're sampling and the areas that you're um, looking to fix or that you're cloning into. So what I mean by this is you don't wanna um, clone from your shadows to your highlights or your highlights to your shadows. And let me show you guys why. So we have this very textured area in our highlights right here. So our highlights are, you know, the brightest part of the photo, right? So if we wanted to, let's just say, take out this lace front, it, wasn't, it would not be beneficial for us to ch choose this textured area and go over the, the shadows because our shadows and our highlights have different amounts of texture in them. So what we would wanna do instead is we want to sample right next to the area that we want to fix. This will basically keep that texture pretty much seamless from shadows to your mid-tones and your highlights. So instead of you going through and blending out all of your texture with the mixer brush tool, you're pretty much sampling and, you know, fixing and, you know, dropping in, you know, little different areas of the image in order for you to get it to where you want it to be. So generally I'll, I'll constantly jump between my high frequency layer and my low frequency layer just because I'm constantly looking at my navigation window over here as a full image just to see if I'm too far off, if, it, if anything looks good zoomed out, if I need to fix anything while I'm zoomed in. Uh, and it helps me just con uh, consistently check my work while I'm working instead of having to constantly zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. We don't wanna have to keep doing all that. So this this one, uh, having our navigation window open definitely does help when it comes to, um, you know, shortening your workflow in that regard. So in areas like this, when we have um, little straight hairs and stuff like that, like I said, this technique, frequency separation is such a powerful technique that you can pretty much get rid of 
almost anything. I'm not gonna say anything, but almost anything. Uh, with just a few brush strokes. Um, so all I'm doing is I'm blending in the colors. I'm actually blending over the areas that I want to get out because I want to make sure that those colors are blended in with what, I, with what I'm trying to replace. And what I'm trying to replace it with is the texture of just the regular skin. So I'll just go in and I'll use my clone stamp tool on my high frequency layer and I'll go in and I'll just clone right over it. I might brush back over it a few times if there's any you know, residue or anything like that, and I can just move on to the next. Same thing with, you know, just little glitter or wet spot. I mean, not wet spots, but little white spots or anything like that. I'll go over with my um, mixer brush on my low frequency layer, and then I'll go to my high frequency layer clone stamp, and I'll get that thing right on out of there. So this is generally, you know, this generally helps when you're you know, trying to be very precise, whether it's a hair campaign, shoot a makeup, um, you know, campaign, shoot uh, beauty, just beauty shots in general. You can even do this on full body shots as well. Although your radius might be a little bit different, your technique is still the same. Um, so you might just have to change a few things here and there whenever you're working on other photos um, that aren't beauty photos, but uh, if you know anything about my work, you know, the majority of my work is not beauty photos, but these were good because I, I definitely wanted to make these videos for you guys uh, and be expecting more videos to come. So if you, you know, enjoyed this video, make sure you let me know uh, whether it's with an email, whether it's via DM, text message, whatever the case may be, just make sure you let me know so I can keep creating these videos and help you guys out in the process. So I'm going to I'm actually going to go through this um, the same way that I go through it, every other photo um, in detail shots like this. You want to make sure that uh, a lot of those bigger blemishes are taken out. It's cool to have, you know, the smaller, um, you know, pores showing um, you don't have to get everything out. I think one one part that a lot of photographers or retouchers kind of mess up on is by taking out too much detail. Sometimes it might be because of the radius and sometimes it might just be because they're so meticulous that they want to get every single, you know, spot and blemish out that they end up taking away too much. Um, knowing the difference between how much to take out and how much to keep, um, knowing how, you know, when to say stop, uh, when to say I'm done, uh, is very vital when it comes to retouching because it is easy to overdo. So you want to make sure that you're always conscious of how much you're actually um, doing. And that's why, you know, you want to have your navigator um, window open just so you can see what all it is that you're doing, what all it is that you're changing and how it looks as a whole versus just zoomed in. So as we go through, like I'm saying, I'm getting those last little finishing touches up uh, around the face and you know, we pretty much have this down pat. We pretty much have the, so let's look at the before and after. So we pretty much made a decent change um, to the photo to where it's a little bit more polished, a lot, a lot more clean. You know, we don't have any huge pores or anything like that showing. And, you know, that's pretty much how we do our simple uh, frequency separation. Um, tactic. Now, on top of that, we do have other ways that you can go in and add more detail because sometimes when you use frequency separation, you can tend to flatten your image depending on how you chose to blend the photo. So majority of the time, we generally go in and we make these changes and sometimes frequency separation may feel like it's enough, but we don't realize how flat the image is in, uh, in its totality. So what we want to do is we want to create what is called dodge and burn layers. So all of these are adjustment layers. You can go to your adjustment layers tab is either going to be over here to your side, or you can go to window and you can go to adjustments and it's going to pull this up and you'll want to create two adjustment layer, um, curve adjustment curve layers. Now you'll want to name one burn. And then you'll want to name your other one 
dodge. Now, before you do anything, I want you guys to hide the dodge layer and we're gonna focus on our burn layer. So your burn layer is pretty much your, uh, your darkening, your, you're either darkening your shadows or you're darkening your highlights. You can choose to do either one. I choose to do it more so on just the shadows and not necessarily the highlights. I leave highlights for my dodge layer, which, which brightens the photo or which brightens you know, areas of the photo. So what generally happens is we'll choose, you know, to how dark we want our shadows to actually be. So let's just say we want our, our shadows to be about that dark. Um, nothing too, too harsh, nothing too fancy. And we'll actually go over here. We'll make sure the layer mask is selected and we'll invert it. What inverting it does is it takes away the effect and it's only going to show on the areas that you brush over on the mask. So you want to make sure that you have a pretty soft um, brush and you want to make sure that your flow is around one to three percent. I like to do it at three percent just because I like to make sure that I can see the difference and I'm willing to add more so that I can subtract versus having to constantly keep adding and then it possibly being too much. But before we do that, we're actually going to do the same thing with our dodge layer. Now we're going to, we don't have to hide our burn layer anymore, but we're going to bring our dodge layer to the forefront or bring it back to light. And then we're going to choose how bright we actually want our highlights to be. Like I said, nothing too harsh, nothing too fancy. Um, but we are going to do the same thing we did to our burn layer and we're going to invert it. What this does, it hides the effect and it's only going to apply on the areas that you brush over. So generally once you do that, you want to just group that and name it, you know, dodge and burn. You name it however you want to. You can put D and B, you can put dodge and burn, you can put you know, DB curves, whatever you want to call it. Um, you're just going to name it like that. Now, the next thing that you want to do is you, you can create a visual aid layer or you can, you know, just do it off the top of your head. Um, but generally, all, all a, a visual aid layer is, is your black and white uh, adjustment layer and your curves layer. These two in itself can help you determine how much or how little you need to actually blend uh, or not blend, but dodge and burn your image. So generally what I'll do, I'll, I'll pretty much do the same thing. I'll probably boost my shadows and boost my highlights up a little bit um, just so I can see more of a difference. And then I'll go back to my dodge and burn layer, go back to whatever layer I choose to do first. We're gonna do dodge first. And we'll just go over these areas that I feel like need to be brought out a little bit more. The reason why I boost it up is just because I, if, if it feels like I'm doing too much with it being boosted, then it pretty much be a, around that area that I want it once I take the visual aid layers off. Now you can group these together. You can, you know, choose to group these and call these, you know, visual, visual aid but make sure you put delete next to it so that you don't, you know, keep it. Unless you like working with black and whites, then you can choose to keep it. But I generally, you know, make sure that I delete it after I'm done. But as you can see, I'm just going over my, um, I'm just going over my brush, uh, my areas that I want to dodge. I'm going, I'm generally strict sticking to just the highlights. I'm not trying to focus uh, on the shadows at all, uh, or on the midtones. Now, sometimes, you know, the midtones can, you know, be touched up um, using dodge and burn, um, but you sometimes, depending on how deep your contrast is in the photo, it can be um, a little bit weird when it gets to um, actually blending it together. On black and white, it doesn't look bad, but as soon as you get the color into it, then it kind of, throws it off a little bit depending on how much you did. So you actually you do want to, you know, constantly turn it on and off just to see if you're you're doing too much or if it's just right. So now we're going to just go in, apply our burn layer to it. Luckily for this, you don't have to change your 
your um, blending modes or anything like that. All you got to do is just go in and like I said, I use my dodge and burn strictly on, you know, the highlights and the shadows uh, and bringing back that definition, bringing back that depth to the photo. Because sometimes you can flatten the photo. Um, but I always make sure I'm going back and forth, making sure I'm not doing too much. I'll zoom out just to see it, even though I have it already zoomed out over here. I just like to see it sometimes uh, as a whole. We'll turn it on and off to see if that was a little bit too much. If it's not, if it's not enough, um, generally that's probably a little bit too much. So I'll generally just go in and take my opacity of the layer of the layer group itself down by half, which means that it's taking down both my dodge and my burn layers by half at the same time. That's a little bit more appealing. If I wanted to go in and add something else, I will, but I'll show you guys another technique on how you can kind of emphasize those highlights and darken those shadows a little bit more without having to do um, this typical um, dodge and burn method. So once we've done dodge and burn, like I said, we can go in and delete our visual A layer. We won't be needing that anymore. But once we do that, then the next step would be actually the lips for me. Um, now you can choose to do your eyes next, you can choose to do your lips or whatever, but I just choose to go with the lips first. And this is actually a cool technique that you actually wouldn't believe that I found on Instagram, or maybe you would believe it, I don't know. You've probably seen it before. But this is actually something that I use just to make sure that that lip gloss is popping, you feel me? So. Generally in areas like this or in um, times like this when you want to boost the um, vibrancy or the contrast of the model's lips or whatever, or their lip gloss or whatever, then you generally want to go in with a regular brush and make sure that your foreground color is white. And you'll go in and you'll actually just color over the areas of the lip gloss that you know already have highlights. And the reason why we're doing this, and you'll see in a minute, is because we're gonna actually make these highlights pop out just a little bit more. So by doing this, we're actually creating highlights in themselves, because I'm also adding them in areas either where I wish there was highlights, or it should be a highlight, or just because I don't want it to just be sparse and, you know, without any sense to it. So once I do that, we're gonna double click on that layer. Now you can name the layer if you want to, you can just put lip highlights or something, but this is where the magic happens. This is where the fun part happens. Cause this is when you actually start seeing what Photoshop can actually do when it comes to, you know, retouching your photos other than just frequency separation and dodge and burn. So this is the underlying layer. What you wanna do is you wanna drag that out until you start seeing your highlights that you just created change. Now, sometimes depending on how big or small or anything like that it is, you know, you'll see certain changes in certain areas and you see some changes they don't. But what you'll end up doing is you'll hold down Alt and you'll actually drag it out until you don't really see those rough edges anymore. Now, sometimes that might mean you have to go in and I, I generally like to create a mask. I don't like to erase anything for real. Uh, so if I create a mask, then I can go in and just take out those parts that either didn't look good or the little extra edges or anything like that that didn't make it, didn't make the cut when we were going through and, you know, changing that. So as you can see, it drastically boosted the uh, contrast of the lips, but it's a little bit too much. So you want to go in and actually apply it to overlay. This kind of gives it more of that glossy feel. And then you want to take your opacity down, maybe about to 50 or something like that. It still gives it a subtle boost. It's just not as strong. So you can choose to make this stronger. You can choose to keep it as bright or as dark as you want to. But in actuality, you know, you want to make sure that you know, it's still pretty close to 
you know, how you originally shot it. You don't want it to be too far off unless you're just trying to, you know, create some spectacular magic or whatever. So the next step is actually the eyes. Now the eyes, now as you can see in this photo, the eyes really don't, they don't stick out too much, but they don't, uh, they tell a story and, you know, they're looking off, giving some type of mystery, uh, mystery or something like that, you know, to the photo. But, you know, they could be popped out a little bit more. Now on this one, I actually am going to use the Retouching Academy panel just because there are some steps in the, the Retouching Academy panel, um, Magic Eyes action that I do like, um, that I have not sat down um, and tried to replicate myself yet. Um, but they are useful and uh, I've, I just find it to be a lot uh, easier um, to edit with than the traditional method. So what it does is it creates multiple layers and I actually bring this out some so you can see what all it says, but you wanna clean the eyes, um, the, the white part of the eyes here. So it actually has a layer group of hue and saturation and a channel mixer that allows you to, uh, and it also removes any like of these blood vessels or anything like that in the eye. So let's just say you just wanted a very clean eye. You know, you wanna make sure that you're on your clean white, eye whites here layer. And you wanna make sure that you just go along with the contour or the shape of the eye. You don't wanna to try to try your best to stay within the lines. But one thing about this is that when you use a layer mask, you have the control to be able to go back with just a simple click of X on your control, uh, on your keyboard. And you actually can go in and refine those edges after the fact. Now, some people don't generally know this. They usually just either erase or they delete and start over again. But this kind of just helps take away that extra step. So by just me pressing X, you'll notice over here that the black and the white are switching places with each other. That's all that, that's all that X is really doing for you in this instance. So let's go back in, zoom in a little bit more, and let's just be a little sloppy with this one. So if we, if we were to do it like that, even though you really wouldn't be able to tell zoomed all the way out, you can tell when you zoom in. So if you are one that's a stickler for detail, then you wanna press X and you wanna mask those extra little parts in. This way, you don't have to worry about, you know, things bleeding into each other. You can have cleaner, images and you don't have to worry about all those extra steps now we're going to do that same thing over here make sure that our brush is white given the fact that our mask is black and we're going to like i said go over the the shape first and then we're going to fill in any additional lines that either got colored over or anything like that. We'll unmask that. And we can try to get this little part, part over here, but you know, certain parts you might wanna leave out depending on how it looks. So our next step is adding the highlights. Now, generally with the highlights, I don't do this at 100%. I generally do it at around 30% um, flow. So you'll see that I changed my flow to 40%, I mean to 30%. And you'll notice that I'll still keep the same brush, but I'm just going to the add light paint with white brush uh, over here. I, add, I go to that layer and any highlights that I want to bring out is when I'll use this. Now this is if you wanna bring out catch lights, if you want to, you know, change up um, you know, change of eye, eye color and things of that nature, which it does also have a layer for that. But if you wanted to just bring those catch lights out a little bit more, um, then this is the layer that does that for you. Now let's just zoom out and let's just see the difference that that magic eyes did. 
So as you see, it kind of opens up the model's eyes a little bit more. She is not um, so dull and mundane to where, you know, it's just like, okay, she got eyes, that's cool. But it brings out that attention a little bit more. It, it makes the image a lot more contrasty in the eye area, given the fact that the rest of her, you know, everything else around her is pretty much in shadows. And, you know, you pretty much just added that small little boost that made a huge difference. So the next step is actually the magic smile. Now, magic smile, you can actually do that uh, yourself. It's the channel mixer as well as hue and saturation. But, um, you know, for keeping this tutorial somewhat short, then I'm gonna just go ahead and use the Retouching Academy uh, action. So I'll go in and what happens with this is, I think it's probably one of the first things that many people uh, who started retouching or started editing learned is, you know, that we have the ability to whiten teeth. Now you can do this uh, in Lightroom as well. This is similar, this is very similar, if not exactly the same uh, as how you would do it in um, Lightroom. But um, this just allows you to have a little bit more control over, you know, what you um, choose to mask in and what doesn't get masked. It does have a little bit more control as far as um, the whiteness you can change. Um, you know, the tone of it, if you go to your hue and saturation and, you know, you either choose to make it more vibrant or less vibrant or, you know, whatever, you can choose to go in and do that. Uh, it won't change any of the other colors. It pretty much just only focuses on white and that's pretty much because of the channel mixer that they chose to use um, in this layer. But just having those two things alone, I'm gonna take these down some, but just having those two elements in there alone just refines the image a lot more. And you can kind of tell the difference once we've, you know, changed. It's kind of brought her face a lot more to life now than how it was when we originally started. Now, for the part that a lot of you probably are waiting on is how do I usually have those super bright, super contrasty highlights like how do i have and have the highlights have so much detail if you don't know what i'm talking about then i'm about to show you so generally what i'll do when it anytime it comes to doing like a quick dodge and burn and i actually have actions that are available in my store um that you can use they're um they're actually under your punch um the punch presets so anytime uh, I want to just boost my highlights up real fast, I'll go to my adjustment layer, I'll go to curves, and I'll just take my highlights up fairly high. And just so I can have a little contrast in them, I'll bring the shadows down just a little bit. Now curves in itself can be an entire video just because it's so much stuff that you can learn um, using, or so much stuff that you can do if you learn using levels and curves to your advantage. But this is just one of the many tricks that I've learned uh, over my time of um, shooting and editing things like, like that. So first thing we do, we set the brightness to where we want it to be. So generally, you know, I don't like my photos being that bright. You do see a little um, discoloration in some areas depending on how bright or how dark you made it. So generally what I'll do is I'll double click on it again. Or I'll double click on it. And we're going to that underlying layer again. So what this does, and I'm gonna move it over so you guys can see how it changes. But as you drag this over, you'll notice that it's taking the highlights out of the shadows. And so what you wanna do is once you found the area that you want it to focus on, we're gonna hold down Alt and we're gonna separate it. And what this does is it's only applying the, sh the highlights to that specific area. Now, as you separate it, it does feather it out a little bit more to, so you can have more of an appealing 
um, look instead of it being so bright and so harsh. Now, once we do this, we can tell that it's been boosted and we can choose to either, you know, go back in, double click on it again, and we want it to, you know, be a little bit brighter, but we didn't want it to, you know, take up so much of the image. Then we'll go back in and we'll change and see, okay, I want that brightness. I want it only in this area, or maybe I want it a little bit more like that. And you'll just go around and you play around with it um, to see exactly where you want it to be. Now, your next thing that you might want to do is if that's too bright, then you might want to go in and adjust your curves. This is why the, the adjustment layers are better than working when you go to image and you go to adjustments and it's actually doing the adjustment on the layer itself. You want to make sure that you have an adjustment layer on its own so that you can go in and change it at any time and it not be so destructive to where you got to go back and delete shit and everything like that. You don't want that. So that's pretty much how we're going to do that. So our next step is actually we're going to click on our background layer and we're going to click select. Now we're going to go to color range with this one. And what you want to do is you want to go to our shadows. Now, given the fact the majority of this photo is shadows, then it's going to pretty much select everything. But the good thing about this is what, what we learned in the last um, few minutes is that adjustment layers are for your advantage. So let's just say we wanted to boost our shadow some, like it's too contrasty or our shadows are too dark um don't have any detail in it we've lost detail in it or whatever generally what you want to do you'll want to go to your curves or you can go to your levels you can do it either one but generally you'll want to go in and you want to just adjust to see you know how you can make that you know work best in your favor now we don't like that little uh effect that it gave us right so we'll go in, we'll double click. And this time, instead of work, focusing on the shadows, we'll focus on the highlights actually. So we actually want to make sure that we retain more of the highlights, I mean, more of the shadows than we do the highlights. So that means we might have to bring this all the way over to get that, to get that tone that we want. Now, generally, more times than not, I'll just go ahead and make these into a preset or an action um, so that I don't have to go in and change it uh, every time or have to do repeat this every time. Um, so I'll generally go in and change it. Um, well, I'll generally go in and apply action. And then from the action, I can change if it's too bright, too dark or anything like that. So actually, I'm going to show you guys what the action looks like itself. I have three different kinds. One is super bright that only focuses on the very brightest of highlights. And then I have another one that is a little less subtle. Uh, given the fact that the highlights aren't too bright in this photo, there's really not much to pull from. And then I have another, a third one, which is similar to the first one. Uh, it just brings out a little bit more uh, of the detail um, and it's not as blown out. And as you can see, it, it affects the eyes, it affects, you know, the hands, it pretty much affects everything. But as you can see, each one of these have a curve layer attached to it. And um, it pretty much just shows you uh, everything that can be done um, when you use that technique. Now. That now this technique was just to show you the difference in you know how to use both of them um, just because you know I chose to be a little bit more dramatic with these then these had a different effect and I could just save these as an action uh, if I wanted to if I like how this um, looks but um, before you know you go too far into it you gotta make sure that it matches your style, it matches your aesthetic, and it doesn't just look like you're just playing around. So generally, if you want to keep an image like this, then I'll suggest to go back in and, you know, finish up 
retouching the, the rest of the image. So that means going in and, you know, doing the shoulders and, you know, any cleavage or any other spots anywhere else, you know, smoothing out the, <clears throat> smoothing out the <clears throat> uh, other uh, areas of the, of the photo so that it can be continued with the face. You don't want the face to be, you know, retouched and then everything else kind of be like blah. So you want to make sure that, you know, you stay consistent. And I generally suggest doing the entire image first uh, with frequency separation before you go into the actual color grading. Um, but it's, you know, editor's choice, retoucher's choice. So you have that artistic freedom to do as you please. But I generally like going in and doing it first so that I don't have to go worry about going in and doing it later. Um, that's just me. Does it make my job a little bit easier? But generally what I'll do, um, you know, I'll just go in, make any small, subtle changes, nothing too much, just get rid of any scars, any acne or anything like that that needs to be taken out. Um, take out any straight hairs if I need to. And if I notice that I didn't, um, that I do the texture first and then, but then do the, um, the color layer, then I'll make sure, um, to correct that. Uh, if I see that it doesn't automatically go away, just like that. And then we pretty much, um, go back in and we just revisit all of our layers just to make sure that everything is uh, aligned and looks the way that we want it to look. Uh, a lot of the times that we don't really um, consider the fact that, um, you know, when we flatten the image that we have to redo everything that, um, you know, was done to the photo uh, or at least in that one step, you know, let's just say, you know, a model says that, you know, you edited her face too much or your the highlights too bright or, you know, something of that nature. And you really want to go back in, but because you flattened it, now you have to pretty much start back over. And this is just pretty much, you know, now going into a larger part of why you don't want to edit as many photos, but keeping all of the layers open, keeping everything organized kind of helps you deviate your way through the entire image. Yes, it may look like a lot of layers when you actually let everything open up, but it is worth it uh, at the end of the day. Now, my final thing that I will do uh, to this photo is actually the color grading. Now her skin tone, as we can see, is pretty much the same. I'm not going to actually have these in there just because I don't want it to be too far off from the actual image, but I will go in and we're gonna use our luminosity masking, which is what I was showing you guys earlier with the color range technique. But we're pretty much going to luminosity masking and we're gonna select all our shadows and I actually have a preset for lightening your highlights. Uh, not lightening your highlights, hi lightening your shadows. So what we'll do is we'll select the area I pressed the wrong one, and we're gonna lighten our shadows. That's what, this is image control, lighten shadows one. So what that does is it brightens all of our shadows. And so now that's a lot more flattering than that first one that we looked at. And if I wanted to only focus on the highlights, and there's many different ways that I go about doing this, but let's just say I just wanted to focus on this area of highlights. Then I actually have another one. Uh, I actually use the light and shadows one again, but this time I've only focused on the highlights and we'll just adjust that layer to get that contrast that we want. And it's kind of similar to what I showed you guys um, with that last technique, but it keeps it a little, it does both jobs for you at one time uh, in a sense. Now, the very last thing I'm gonna show you guys is how to clean up those stray hairs and everything like that on one go. 
Now you can do this in multiple different ways. It's, it's the long way, it's the short way, and then it's just, you know, Winfrey way. Don't quote me on that. But what we're, go what we're gonna do is we're going to merge all visible uh, layers. So you can actually go up here and you can go to Uh, which which one is it? I only know the um, shortcut for it. So hold on one second. Let me get this. So actually, yeah, merge visible layers right here. Now you can choose to either do this and then make it and then make the change, which is very destructive, or you can choose to hold Control, Alt, Shift, and E, and it'll actually just make a copy of everything um, and put it to the top. Now what this does is it just allows for you, for this next step to be a lot easier. So we can go and generally you can do this um, towards the beginning. And generally you can do this towards the beginning of your editing process instead of waiting until the end. Like I said, it just depends on how your workflow is. But generally what I'll do is I'll go to select and I'll go to subject. I allow Photoshop to figure out what my subject is. We're gonna see how accurate this, this selection is. All right, so it's pretty accurate. It's pretty, it pretty much knows that we don't want all those extra hairs in there. So what we could do is we can create a mask or we can just duplicate on uh, the background layer itself. Which one are we gonna choose to do? We're actually gonna just keep this selection as it is. So what it allows you to do is by having a selection, everything that's not within the selection will not be altered or messed with. So this allows you to color outside the lines. And generally what I'll do is I'll use a mixer brush tool, especially if it's on a, um, oops, especially if it's on a, um, plain background, I'll generally blend towards the subject, given the fact that none, nothing that I'm doing on the outside of this selection is going to be in effect, or going to be affected. So I generally blend towards uh, the subject so that I don't get no um, weird residue um, from color, uh, from the hair or anything like that. And I'll try to just go in, do my best to you know blend everything together seamlessly get rid of those extra hairs and the next thing that we'll do is use the clone stamp tool to kind of finish up and wrap up um you know any of the cleanup process that we need to do this is another way that i can go go about um using the uh mixer brush tool to blend my backgrounds and clean my backgrounds up. Um, but also it's, it's good to use, um, you know, just when you're trying to clean your image up and you don't want to, um, you know, waste too much time having to go back and, you know, go over every single hair stroke and things of that nature. So as you can see, in my little navigator window over here. You can kind of see how it looks, you know, after I've blended everything. So we can actually make a copy of this so we can continue to work on this layer. We're gonna press our clone stamp tool and we'll just copy and you can, you know, blend every blend out everything else by hand. I try my best to not have to go through this um, 
this step just because it can be very time consuming uh, if you you know don't blend from the right areas or don't copy or clone from the right areas you'll see that the colors you know will start to kind of skew kind of look a little wonky um, depending on how detail oriented you were when you did it but this just helps clean your image up and makes it a lot more appealing. Now, I can choose to just merge down with just Control E, and then I can go back to my blending, um, my clone, nah, not my clone stamp, but my mixer brush tool, and I can just blend those wonky colors back out of it. So, as you can see, that is the before, and that is the after. So as you guys saw, that's from beginning to end how I get a flawless photo. I can pretty much say this is a flawless photo, but this is pretty much how you can get a flawless photo from beginning to end using my retouching methods. So if you guys enjoyed this video, hope, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. But if you guys enjoyed it, let me know any other videos that you want me to create. Let me know if there's anything else you want to learn. And I would definitely be glad to make another video. And if you're watching this um, for my online course, then I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.